Okay, here we go, the dreaded Hebrew 6. I've been kind of thinking about this off and on today. You know, it's interesting. Today, God, I have still so much more to say. And um, for a couple weeks, maybe a month, I think the grace believers were uh, in a season of just kind of like, we're so done with this arguing and, you know, I don't have the strength for it anymore. I don't have any patience for it. And then the uh, enemies of the gospel, if you will, started getting a little more rabid. And uh, some of us, including myself, had to pray that we wouldn't be offended and would lay hold of Christ. And he, I prayed, you know, God, give me strength, give me wisdom, pray you give us wisdom and words to counter these things. And, um, and sure enough, the last day or two, or, I'm sorry, the last day has been a renewal of invigoration to lay out the truth. And uh, it's just interesting. I, I don't have any kind of offense or bitterness in my heart or anger, uh, frustration, um, but it's a, it's a little different. There's a, there's a little different feeling, and I think it's the Lord renewing us. And, and I noticed today that everybody in the Grace community was giving out videos, you know, um, pretty interesting so anyway but i've been thinking on, on and off about how do i deal with this hebrew 6 because and it's interesting tim henderson did a did a video on this today um but i'm not i just don't feel led to take that approach because here's the thing these verses have been highlighted bolded red-faced italicized larger font in our minds and the people who are approaching them to try to like combat these ideas still to me, we seem to approach it still from that perspective as if it's actually underlined and highlighted and bolded and, and redlined. And I feel like if anything, we got to get it back down to the same font as the rest of the flow of the narrative. In other words, we usually take these verses and try to defend grace from these verses out of context and that makes still makes them say things i think that the apostle was not saying um and i just feel like the whole tone needs to come down quite a bit for us to understand these verses by placing them into the flow and in the same font as all the text around it if you know what i mean the enemy's the one who through his systems of error exaggerates the importance of verses and makes them the narrative when really they're just a supporting point or a blip along the way of a larger point that's being made. And so it's good to see it in light of the flow. And what so what I thought is I would read the build-up verses and I'll read the rest of the chapter. Then I'll come back and deal with those and then deal with the rest of the chapter. Because I think when you see the context you'll see that it doesn't make sense for us to address these verses which with such extremis, if you will, uh, in light of everything else that's being said. Um, okay, so let me try this. So at the end of chapter 5, he was starting to talk about Melchizedek, and he was starting to get into the heavier things that really can give you some assurance. To see that your salvation is based on this high priestly role that Christ occupies. And ultimately we'll see that he's undertaken to, pro, to keep us all the way to the end. And he's the one who keeps us going. He has taken responsibility for our life. We put our responsibility behind us when we acknowledged in baptism or by believing that we have been crucified with Christ and we reckoned ourselves dead. And that means that we're not allowed to do this. And then we see ourselves risen with Christ. That's the foundation of the Christian life. We die, Christ rises, and Christ is our life. He has taken responsibility to be the head of his body and the life of every member. It's his life, not ours. That's what's being lived, okay? And that's all, you know, that's what the high priesthood of Melchizedek is all about. 
It is the power of an incorruptible life that upholds this whole thing. And then he says, you know, he starts to say that, and then he says, of whom, and in verse 11, of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, because now we're getting into things that are reality and spiritual truth that's hard to utter, hard to give words to it in the first place, much less understand it if you're one of the hearers. If Paul's saying, or the writer is saying, it's hard to utter, how much harder is it for us to hear? <laughs> And he says, the reason it's hard for you to hear, and even the reason it's hard for us to be uttered, these hard truths, are difficult truths to understand, is because you're dull of hearing. Why had they become dull of hearing? Why couldn't he go further in this, in this line? Why did he have to address this? Well, because, remember, they were, he was warning them about neglecting so great a salvation and letting these things slip. They were being distracted. They were believers. He's not addressing unbelievers. He's addressing believers who are in an intoxicating religious environment with the glorious temple, which is one of the wonders of the world, and the sacrifices, and the smells, and the blood, and the all. It was so tactile, and so much in your face, and so righteous, and so God-ordained, that it was very difficult to grasp that christ this man little man from nazareth even though he is risen from the dead had replaced all this and even though they were regenerated in their spirit their mind was staggering back and forth between new truths and old environments right and so this because they and, and then they started to let the new truths slip and were in danger of neglecting so great a salvation right and uh which meant that they could be brought back into bondage back under the law and and really get themselves confused and then be in the situation like the galatians were where they're saved but they're but the uh Christ has become no effect, and they start biting and devouring one another and everything. That was not these people's case, though. These people had a better condition than those of the uh, Galatians, as we'll see. But then he says, you know, you have started to become dull of hearing, so it's hard for us to talk about these things. For when, for when the time came that you ought to be teachers, you should be teaching these things, you have need that we teach you once again the first principles of the oracles of God. And are become such as need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. But strong meat belongs to those that are full of age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And this is, what he's saying is, and we covered this a little bit, but, um, you know, the they're going back to, the, the, they're staring in awe at this religious system that they're being asked to leave behind and it's dulling their spiritual sense and they need to exercise their sense to discern good and evil what is good and evil here good is laying hold of christ and partaking of him evil is holding on to anything even that which god ordained if it becomes a stumbling block and an obstacle for you to lay from you uh, for you from laying hold of Christ, okay? And they needed their senses to be resharpened, okay? And he's telling them, look, like you're acting like babies. You actually are more mature than this, but you've been, you kind of neglected things, and now you're staring at this great big system and going, well, should we have left that? Shouldn't we try to incorporate that into this? Surely Christ didn't leave that behind. That's our, that's our history. That's our tradition. God ordained that, you know? See how hard that would be? None of us could do well in this if we were there. This would be very difficult. This is one of the reasons why God had to destroy the temple. The temple and the city in Jerusalem was such an anchor that it really caused confusion as long as it was allowed to stand. And in order to get the church into heavenly truths, he had to demolish the earthly aspects of the religion that they were leaving behind. Uh, the, the monuments to it, you know. Okay, so... He's saying, look, don't be a baby. You should be a teacher, okay? And then, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, uh, elementary principles is how it should be, is probably a better way to say it. 
Uh, let us go on to perfection, not laying a hold of the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God, of doctrine of baptisms and laying on of hands and resurrection from the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Now remember, this is going back to the beginning. That system was so attractive that it made them question, you know, how did we get saved? What, what do we do? Do we don't have the high priest? We have a, oh, we've got high priest in heaven. Well, they, they, they even know that yet. I don't know. He's talking about it now. Um, they need to be aware that they now have a high priest that's passed through the heavens. Because they're looking at the high priest in the temple and going, well, that looks real. That looks like what we're supposed to be doing. And that's calling into question everything about the Christian faith. And so he's saying, look, you're going back to the beginning and having to reestablish a foundation of the basics of how you got saved. And that's what we do all the time when we uh, entertain like the legalists because we're having the arguments about the very basics of how to get saved and how to stay saved. How, you know, if we can't get past that, how are we going to move on and be perfected? And that's why I said, watch what YouTube videos you watch. You know, if you keep watching these folks, your senses will be dulled and you'll start. I, I, I know people who are mature in grace who tell me after Watching so many videos, they get turned upside down, and then they have to go back and reestablish the foundation. And that's what he's saying is, look, you're not, we need to move on. We need to move on. I'm trying to tell you about a heavenly set of realities that you can enjoy so you can partake of Christ, and you're going back to the beginning trying to figure out if you're saved, okay? Um, so doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, of eternal judgment. That's the very basics that we establish when we get saved. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible. Now, here's he says, for it's impossible for those who were once enlightened to have tasted the heavenly gift and were made such partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them unto repentance, seeing they crucified themselves again, the Son of God afresh, and put them to open shame. For the earth which brings in the rain, uh, drinks in the rain, it comes off and on it, and brings forth herbs, meat. Uh, for them who is dressed receives a blessing from God. But that which bears thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. Now let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. Okay? Don't stop there. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love which you've showed towards his name and that you've ministered to the saints and minister in other words you've got re rewards laid up you're not only saved but you've got rewards laid up and we desire that every one of you show the same diligence to full assurance of hope and to the end that you not be slothful but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promise for when god made promise to abraham because he could swear by no greater he swore by himself saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had endured, he obtained the promise. He patiently endured and obtained a promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is that to them an end of all strife, wherein God willing more abundantly to show to the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us, which hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters that within the veil. Wherefore, the forerunner for us is entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, if you read that whole chapter... What is the emphasis? Is the emphasis that you could fall away or is the emphasis absolute assurance? God willing more abundantly to show the immutability of his counsel to the heirs of his promise, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things by which it is poss impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, comfort. Who have fled, you know, to, and we have laid hold of a hope set before us. And this hope itself is an anchor that enters into the veil. It brings us right in. And there our forerunner went, the Melchizedek. And now he's back to talking about Melchizedek. So what's all this at the beginning? In context, 
all he's saying here is you've become dull of hearing and let's not be slothful, but let's by patience keep pressing on until we come fully assured of our hope. And look, let's talk about how God has anchored that hope in an immutable set of realities, and he cannot lie. So is he telling you here that you could lose your salvation? Absolutely not. He's telling you exactly the opposite. So that's the gist of the chapter. Now, when you get to these verses, 4 through 6, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened to having tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they should fall away to renew them to repentance, seeing they crucify themselves to the Son of God afresh and put into open shame. Okay, and then he talks about bearing thorns, right? The rain keep camp coming and you're bearing thorns. You're, you're the end of that, it's rejected and nigh under cursing, and the end is to be burned, okay? Now, first of all, is he talking about them? No, because verse 9, But, beloved, we're persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation. Now, what accompanies salvation? Security, assurance, immutability of the promise, inheritance. It's all on Jesus. You're safe. That's what salvation means. So we're persuaded of things that accompany salvation, okay? Though we thus speak. So even though we speak this way, even though I'm using this language, I'm telling you, you don't have to worry, okay? If you are saved, you don't have to worry about this. That's the first thing. Now, getting into the interpretation. Did he mean for this to be an interpretation of what apostasy looks like? First of all, the word apostasy is not in this verse 6 where it says fall away. That's not the same word in the Greek as what's used in Thessalonians where it talks about the apostasy of the uh, departure or falling away. It's a different word. It, uh, but it does mean to fall into error fall on the wayside, but it's not apostasy. Not that that really even matters, but I just noticed that when I was looking at this today. Um, now, these, what he's saying is you've been enlightened, you've tasted the heavenly gift, you've been made partakers of the Holy Ghost, you've tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. And what he's saying is, look, if you've gotten this far, to fall back, is to go back to the elementary principles and go, am I saved? How do we get saved again? What do, you know, going back to the principle, first principles of the doctrine of Christ uh, versus going on to perfection, going back to milk rather than meat, going back to laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God and doctrines of baptism, laying on of hands of resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Those are the basic things that you get settled when you get saved, and yet they were going back to it as they staggered in their minds in the face of this tactile religion that seemed to have all the answers. And they were being uh, so enamored with that that they were losing sight and neglecting their great salvation, and they were going back to milk rather than being able to take the meat. So that's what he's saying is, look, You've tasted all of this. You're in such a good place now. Don't go back to that. You can't reestablish repentance. What are you going to do? Crucify the Son of God afresh? And put him to an open shame? That's the same thing he says in Galatians to Peter when Paul says, uh, For if I build that, again, that which I destroyed, I become a transgressor. And he was talking about going back to the law. If I go back to the law and build up that system again, after I've already renounced it and laid hold of Christ, I, I'm making it like laying hold of Christ was a transgression, some kind of sin. That puts Christ to an open shame. And then I have to repent of that again and then crucify. You know, so what, they're, what he's saying is, look, you can't renew yourself to this repentance. This is actually shows you that you can't repent your whole life. You cannot renew yourself to repentance. You repented when you laid hold of Christ. You've already, he's already been crucified for you and you believed it and you passed out of death and into life. You've partaken of the eight powers of the age to come. You've tasted the good word. You, you're in, okay? And yet, if you go back to the milk and try to figure out if you're even saved again, you're basically trying to renew 
that basic foundation, trying to repent again. Try, it's like going up to the altar call every week and trying to get saved again. You, what are you doing when you do that? You're in unbelief and you are shaming Christ and uh, putting him to an open shame as if his death was not perfected. His death was not enough and something is required of you. See? And you're crucifying him again. Now, I know that's different than what, like, Tim Henderson today was saying, no, this is clearly speaking of people who didn't get saved. The um, thorns, the thorny ground, you know, or the, the, the different kinds of soil, and um, the word wasn't profitable, and so they didn't get saved. I don't think that. I think what he's literally talking about is simply, look, if you go back to, you've received all this rain, and you've been drinking all this good stuff of Christ, and now you're you're confused and you're going back to the old religion and now you're staggering between the two going, which one is right? Really? <laughs> and he's saying, look, you've drank all this rain. It was producing herbs, meat for them who, by who it was dressed. It was bringing forth blessings, fruit, and receiving blessing of God. How do we know that? Because verse 10 for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you showed towards his name, and you minister to the saints, and you still minister. So they're bearing fruit. He's saying, look, you're bearing fruit. So that which bears thorns, though, you're not going to bear fruit if you go back. Bear thorns and briars, it's rejected, and nine to cursing, the end to be burned. That's the same kind of thing he said to the Galatians. He said, if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed of another. See, they were by losing sight of Christ, they were in the gospel as their source in Galatians, they were losing the flow of the Spirit. And that meant that the fruit was going to die out, and because they weren't abiding in him. And so therefore, they were going to resort to the flesh and eventually be biting and devouring and being jealous and provoking one another to envy and all the different things. And then all the other works of the flesh were going to manifest eventually. The evil, adultery, fornication, witchcraft, variance, heresies, all of that comes out. It's all latent in our flesh. All we have to do is get away from the gospel, neglect it, become sluggish, and forget how great of a salvation we have, and then get attracted to some earthly religion. Whether it's people-pleasing in some, uh, you know, charismatic church or going back to jerusalem it doesn't really matter you get your eyes off christ and back onto people and performance and then the fruit of the spirit is gone and now the briars and thorns and thistles are coming out and he says they're gonna, gonna be nigh under cursing if that's the way it is you know so all he's saying is look you're in danger of getting yourself back into the flesh and losing all of your fruit bearing and getting into a really bad spot but Beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. Even though we're using the strong language, we are persuaded of things that accompany salvation. You can be secure. You have an anchor for your soul that's within the presence, within the veil. So that's my interpretation of this. Now, I'm going to break this up. I'll do another one maybe tomorrow for the rest of the chapter six because there's really good stuff in here and I need to study a little bit. But um, this is how I diffuse, I felt led to diffuse those first verses to put them in context and say, look, it's not saying as dramatic of a thing that it seems to be, although he's using colorful language. It's not about apostasy. It's not about the possibility of losing your salvation, you know, nor is it even necessarily talking about the unsaved. It's talking about going back to milk and reestablishing what you are already good at and should have been teaching, you know, it's ridiculous. And yet we do it, so... Okay, talk to you later.